Greetings all, Ferrari Man 601 here. Welcome to the review of La Ferrari. Yes, I don't think it needs any more introduction than that. Everybody knows what this car is. This is the premier Ferrari that you can get today. It is quite literally called the Ferrari. Yes. Firstly, a note on the name of this car. This car has been out for a few years. It's been in Aceto Corsa, I believe, since the Steam Early Access release in 2014. However, the name of this car is La Ferrari. That's Italian for the Ferrari. It is not called the Ferrari La Ferrari. It is not called the Ferrari. It is just called La Ferrari. That is it. If you call it anything other than that, it's redundant. You cannot say the La Ferrari because then you're literally saying the the Ferrari. You get it? Okay, enough ranting about the name. What have we here? Well, what this car is is the latest in the absolutely ridiculous line of super exotic hypercars that Ferrari have been giving us since the mid 1980s, going all the way back to the 288 GTO. Yes. This car is the successor to the Enzo, which came out in 2002, thereabout, and in 2013, Ferrari decided to unveil this, the Ferrari. La Ferrari gets its name because Ferrari are trying to say that, yes, this is the definitive example of the best road car that we can produce right now. And, well, considering they've yet to supersede it, that apparently is still true here in 2018. The car was in production from June of 2013 to January of 2016. They made 500 coupes like this that you see here. From October to 2016 to August 2018, so basically right now, La Ferrari Aperta was being produced, Aperta being Italian for open. As the name suggests, the Aperta has an open roof or a removable roof, kind of similar to a Targa Top, kind of like you got on the F50, which is another car in this line of Ferrari hypercars. After production ceases on the Aperta, nobody really knows what Ferrari's doing next. We know that they have the FXX program. The FXXK is a track-only variant of La Ferrari. However, nobody really knows what they're going to do next. What will the next hypercar from Ferrari be? Well, we're probably going to have to wait another few years to see it. La Ferrari, of course, being introduced in 2013, perhaps 2023 or thereabout is when we will see its successor. However, be that as it may, this is what we have to appreciate from the Ferrari road-going division right now, and it is absolutely stupendous. Styled in-house, by Ferrari, which is somewhat unique nowadays. For a long time, Ferrari basically outsourced their details, anyway, in external design to Italian design house Pininfarina. However, Ferrari have decided to take that, ta that task and that challenge unto themselves, and they styled La Ferrari in the house. And here it is. What we've ended up with is a two-door, two-seat sports coupe in this model. Aperta, obviously, you could call that a not a cabriolet, it's a T-top, basically, going back to the 80s in terms of logic. Two-door sports car. It is rear-engined and rear-wheel drive. Rear-engined in a liberal sense. It's mid-engined, really. The engine is right behind the passenger compartment integrated there with the fuel cell and the gearbox and everything else. Of course, Rear-wheel drive and mid-engine, it's a V12. Yes, only the Ferrari hypercars will be V12, mid-engine, and of course, rear-wheel drive. And that continues that lineage going back once again to the 288 GTO. Specifically, the V12 engine in the back of this thing, it is a 6.3 liter type F140 FE. Yep, V12. The engine by itself is producing all sorts of ridiculous levels of horsepower. However, that's not all. The engine is coupled to a system that Ferrari call high curves. What this means is, yes, curves. Remember that from Formula One? Well, Ferrari have adapted that technology and they have put it on the road in this car right here. Combined, the V12 engine and the hybrid powertrain, which also only sends power to the rear wheels, they produce about 950 horsepower. If 
you want to speculate a little bit on Formula One power levels, well, it's quite comparable to the power that you're getting in a Formula One car even now in 2018. So 950 horsepower going to the rear wheels in a road car. It doesn't get too much more ridiculous than that. The only Ferrari that has a documented power output higher than this is the FXXK, again, the track variant of La Ferrari. Where to begin on a car like this? Obviously, it's ridiculously expensive. This specification, only 500 exist in the entire world, and I'm assuming most of those 500 still exist right now. They have survived their journeys of ownership. It's absolutely exclusive. It doesn't get too much more exclusive than this. Anyway, we mentioned that engine. The driveline, obviously, it's a it's a hybrid driveline, internal combustion engine, and a hybrid system, that high curve system. The gearbox, though, seven-speed, dual clutch, automated manual, they call it. It's a semi-automatic, paddle actuated on the back of the steering wheel, of course, and when we go into the cockpit, we'll take a closer look at that configuration. Overall dimensions on this thing. Wheelbase, 2,650 millimeters. Overall length, 4,702 millimeters with 1,992 millimeters. Height, 1,116 millimeters. And the curb weight, ready to go with all of the fuel and fluids installed, 1,585 kilograms or 3,495 pounds. It's actually pretty heavy but it's got 950 horsepower, so don't worry about that. And also, have a look at this bodywork. It has the drag coefficient, to quote Jeremy Clarkson, has a drag coefficient of a fish. Absolutely ridiculous technology in this car. Of course, being introduced in 2013, it does borrow a lot of technology from Formula One. That high curve system, that's a direct borrowing from Formula One cars of the era. Remember the older version of curves that was introduced in 2009, the electric motor, the driver had a 6.6 .6 second per lap power boost of about 60 horsepower. Well, that system is in here and well, it's been upgraded even more. Exteriorly, what we have on La Ferrari, it is nothing short of miraculous. Have a look at the styling decisions that Ferrari made, but also have a look at the aerodynamic solutions that they've come to. Of course, looking at the front nose, it is quite evocative of the front nose cone and wing assemblies of a Formula One car. This is really a styling cue that goes back all the way to the F50 of 1995 that triangular profile that you see when you look at the car head-on like this. I think the most provocative, shall we say, example of this styling is actually on the Enzo, where the front nose of the car actually does protrude beyond the rest of the bodywork. Here on La Ferrari, it's, it's basically tucked into the rest of the front fascia. However, it is still there, and it is still unbelievably evocative of the front end of a Formula One car. Speaking of what else is on the front end of a Formula One car, you can see that we do have this little chin wing here right on the front end of the car. This already is starting to work the air as the car begins to pass through it. First of all, you can see this big hole cut into the front end. This is to feed that massive radiator that you can see behind it. You can see it's been tilted forward relative to the airflow. This is to expose more surface area of that radiator to the onrushing airstream thus making it more efficient, and because it's tilted the way it is, they could put a larger radiator in there and still basically fit it in the space provided. On either side of these two big intakes, we have two smaller intakes. These are for feeding the brakes. Yes, brake ducts in here for brake cooling. As this car has big carbon ceramic rotors and those carbon carbon pads, yeah, they're going to generate a lot of heat, and yes, they need to be cooled properly. Additionally on here, and we can't see this on this Aceto Corsa model, but underneath the front nose, we have active aerodynamics. We have flaps on the bottom side, that bottom profile of the front end of this car. They can change their angle of attack depending on how fast the car is going. They can be trimmed out for maximum speed. They could also be trimmed up for more downforce in the front. And I believe they also have the capacity, kind of like the front winglets on the Pagani Waira, to change their angle of attack independently of one another so that you can get more lateral cross downforce, if you will, as you're going through corners and help the car roll in and roll out of the corners a little bit more at high speed. Very cool things to see here. Moving arrears on the car, first of all, we'll take a look at the wheels and tires. 
Very nice five-spoke design, of course, styled in-house from Ferrari, wrapped in Michelin Pilot Sport tires. Very nice detail here from Kunos on the model and the texturing. I also really like the texture there in the brake rotors. You can see that they are cross-drilled very nice, but you can also see that carbon ceramic texture work. Very cool. Across the top side of the front end, here is a little styling cue that you might recognize from Formula One. That looks an awful lot like an S-duct, does it not? Well, yes it does, and it kind of is an S-duct. The real point of this thing's existence, though, it's not so much for downforce generation, although it does, I suppose, produce some incidental downforce. It's really just to extract the air from that radiator that we mentioned before. Again, here's that radiator, sort of tilted forward there in the front compartment, and then here is the outlet. There are also two big fans in here. Of course, this is the car's primary radiator, so you do need to keep it cool. You need to keep air flowing through there, so two big extractor fans as well. I imagine they also help a little bit with downforce generation. Moving across to the midsection of the car, you can see through the doors here. This is not a trick of the light. These are really big ducts cut into the profile of the door as well as into the profile of the engine cover there and you can see two more gigantic radiators mounted on either side here obviously that one's the left side this one's the right side it's symmetrical of course these double as air intakes for the engine again we are normally aspirated in here so big intake plenums going back there into the top end of the motor you need that airflow for the engine to breathe properly, you also need that airflow for cooling, as you might imagine. Of course, the structure of the doors themselves, they are all carbon. Most of the bodywork on this car is carbon, as well as the chassis, all a carbon composite material, basically made in the same facility that produces Ferrari's Formula One car. So there is your pedigree right there. Coming across to the rear zone of the car, you can see that we have got a couple extractor ducts from either side of those radiator inlets. So these would be the radiator outlets. You can also see how that bodywork has been sculpted to help keep the air attached and funnel it toward the center line of the car here behind the rear clamshell so it can be extracted and expelled from the rear end of the car. Speaking of extraction and expulsion, we have got this big rear grill here. This is just to ventilate the engine bay a little bit. And expulsion, here are your exhaust outlets. Two on each side, four in total. They absolutely make a tremendous noise. Also at the rear here, we do have a big diffuser. It is totally functional. It's actually responsible for a lot of this car's downforce generation. And inside the diffuser here, you can see these two flaps, one on each side. These also move similarly to the flaps in front. And what they do is they also allow the car to be trimmed out for maximum top speed, so minimum drag. They can also be trimmed more aggressively to add more downforce at lower speeds and around corners as well. That's not the only bit of active aero that we've got on this car, though. You can see, and, and one thing that does distinguish La Ferrari from some of its other predecessors, particularly the F40 and the F50, you don't really see a big rear wing on this car, and you didn't see a big rear wing on the Enzo either. But, the Enzo does have a rear wing, and so does this car. You can see there, pressing zero on the numpad, we can extend the rear wing on this car. I'm not entirely sure if we should call this a wing, or if we should call this a spoiler. It's not that big, and it's really not that conspicuous. But, what this does, is at certain predetermined speeds, or in certain predetermined driving conditions, the ECU will command this spoiler to deploy. And what it does is twofold. One, it will add some more rear downforce. We mentioned how the air is being funneled out of those radiator exhausts here. It's being funneled toward, when it's extended, that rear spoiler. Also, what this does is it functions as an air brake. When you are braking hard from high speed in this car, this spoiler will also deploy, but it doesn't just deploy all at once. It's not an on or off function. It has the ability to modulate the extent of its deployment relative to how much brake pressure you're applying. So it is really smart, really sophisticated, active aero going on with this car, and it's absolutely fantastically detailed here by Kunos. Have a look inside the rear valance there through the meshwork. We'll retract the spoiler and you can see that the little armatures in there, the hinge mechanisms that control it, are also articulated in the modeling work. Absolutely tremendous job here by Kunos. 
Also, what's tremendous is that engine. Yeah, 6.3 liter V12. There's the big intake plenum right there on top for that engine and also the top of the oil tank where you'd add some more oil. Yeah, that is something I would love to walk into my garage and see. Well, that'll never happen. Anyway, we mentioned those doors earlier. Let's open them up. And now you can see into the interior of La Ferrari. You can also see just how compact the chassis is. Again, we'll close the doors and you can see the overall exterior lines of the car. We'll open them again and you see the sides of the monocoque. That's the chassis. You can see that the actual width of the doors right there it accounts for quite a bit of the car's overall width inside there. Again, you're just sitting inside the carbon monocoque. The, ch the chassis itself is quite small. And of course, this is all done twofold manner. This is for weight savings, number one. That's also the reason why they made it in carbon, but also it is for aerodynamics. You'll notice that the cross section of a Formula One car, for example, is as narrow as it's allowed to be in the regulations because the less frontal area you've got, the less drag you're going to generate. On this car, the same philosophy holds true. If you can make the chassis as narrow as possible, that's less drag that you're going to generate. Therefore, more of the engine's power is going to be spent making you go really fast rather than just cutting through the air and losing all of that efficiency due to the air resistance. Let's go into the cockpit and take a closer look at what's going on in here. In the cockpit now, we'll close the doors and we can just start to have a look at everything that's going on in here. You'll notice that, well, in terms of amenities, we don't really have all of that much. We do have this stupendous dash display there, mostly digital. The tachometer, though, is analog. However, we don't have a radio. We don't have satellite navigation. We don't have carpets. Yeah, the list of things that we don't have is longer than the list of things that we do, but Something tells me that if you have bought this car, you're not going to care that much about the relative lack of amenities because when you've got 950 horsepower, I think things like connecting your phone or listening to the radio or getting the weather report, it's probably not something that you're particularly concerned about. What we do have in this car, though, is an absolutely ridiculous electronic system loaded with all sorts of bells and whistles that are designed to make you go faster and have fun while you're doing it. First of all, this steering wheel. Let's see, we've counted buttons on steering wheels somewhat recently. How many do we have on here? One, two, three, four, five, six, plus a rotary switch which appears to have five distinct positions. That's it. Also on this steering wheel, you'll notice some functions that are normally reserved for steering column stocks, but they've been migrated onto the steering wheel in this car. You'll see on either side you have the turn signals. You also have there on the bottom left, you have the control for the headlights. You have an engine start button. You have a little button there on the bottom left with a picture of a shock absorber on it. That's to raise the nose to go over speed bumps or the ends of driveways, things like that. On the lower right hand side you have a little rotary switch. This is called Manetino and what this does is it very quickly allows you to select different drive modes for the car. They will change things uh, in the traction control, they'll change the aggression of the gear shifts, they'll change the aggression of the throttle application. All kinds of things can be done just with that little five position rotary switch. Above that appears we have some controls for the windscreen wipers and then above that we have the right hand turn signal. Of course in the center you have got the horn which is probably not really necessary in a car like this. I don't think there are going to be too many people going faster than you, therefore you'll be in front of everyone. Toward the center, we have climate control. Believe it or not, the car does have heat and air conditioning despite not having a radio, but hey, that's fine. Below that, on this very interesting and intricate carbon stalk that just sort of extends itself, looking through this section. This just sort of comes out of nowhere in the center console. You can see buttons for reverse, automatic mode for the gearbox, and launch control. Yep, launch control, of course, in this car. Below that, you see a traditional switch for the hazard indicators, and you also see that we have power windows in this car. So, buttons there in the center console for that. This button here, not entirely sure what that is. Perhaps that opens the rear clamshell? 
Or perhaps that opens a secret compartment back here someplace. If there is one, I don't know what that little button is there. Or maybe it does nothing at all. Who knows? If you have one of these cars, please let me know in the comments. But beyond that, yeah, this is what we've got in here. Over here in the center stack, of course, climate control that we mentioned, defrost, uh, air conditioning control, temperature select, fan speed. And then over here, though, you can see that we have this joystick with the volume control button. We have a main display on and off toggle there for the display on the dashboard, menu setup, and then back view, that is for the rear camera on this car. All navigated with that joystick slash knob selector right there. Below that, it appears we have a USB port and a power outlet as well. And that's really about it for what we've got in this car. Again, you're not as distracted with things in this car as you would be in most others. But coming back down, taking a look at the dashboard, we have got, let's see, on the left-hand side, fuel level. We have water temperature and oil temperature in the center, obviously a tachometer. When the car is turned on, that will also show us our selected gear. And then on the right, we have a battery charge level. Remember, this is technically a hybrid and an analog speedometer. The blue bar that you can see right next to the tack is a, 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 basically it's a level indicator. It's not showing you how much electricity you have remaining. It's showing you how much electricity is being applied right now. You don't have direct control of the hybrid system in this car. It's all handled automatically, kind of like how it is now in Formula One, but you can see what it is doing. Very, very cool. In the track only variant, the FXXK, you do have more control over the deploy and harvest settings in that hybrid system. But here, this is strictly a road legal version of the car. So, well, they've decided to take some of the fun away from you. We will leave the cockpit now and head back outside for one final look. I also just want to highlight how dramatic this car looks when the doors are open. We saw these doors for the first time on the Enzo back in 2002. They've basically been carried over with no change at all for La Ferrari, but close them up. And yeah, the car looks very cool just all on its own, but when those butterfly doors pop open, it really does have a very dramatic effect. So, yes, I'm glad that Ferrari kept these doors for La Ferrari. I do wonder what they will do for whatever its successor is going to be, but I hope that they maintain that sort of look. I think the only more extreme solution that they can come to is to make whatever the next flagship hypercar is for the group. Probably the most extreme solution they could get is not to put a roof on it, not to put doors on it, just have the driver come in and out of the top of it like you do in a Formula One car. Who knows if they'll do something like that? Probably not if I were a betting man because I don't know if that would pass any crash tests whatsoever, but I don't know. We can dream. Anyway. We do have to go drive this car, and, well, where better to do it? We're going to take it to Imola. We're going to drive La Ferrari next. Stand by. Welcome to L'Autodromo Enzo e Dino Ferrari. How could you not go to this circuit? It's literally named after the founder and son of the founder of Ferrari, so you must review a Ferrari here. There is no better place, not even Monza is better a place than Imola. Anyway, here is the car sitting in the pit lane. Let's go to the setup screen and take a look at what's going on. Well, first, the gear display. Fixed ratios in the box, of course. You can see, theoretically, our top speed, 422 kilometers per hour at the top end there in seventh gear. You will never reach those kinds of speeds because, number one, there really does not exist any road long enough, and number two, well, you'd probably have to be in a vacuum, but theoretically that's what we're geared out for in seventh gear. Seventh gear in this car is really not meant to be used all that much. It's effectively an overdrive ratio for extended highway cruising. Imola is not a highway, therefore we won't be using seventh gear here really. Tires, two compounds to choose from. We have the native Aceto Corsa Hypercar Trofeo, which is more of a track-only tire, and then we have the Hypercar Road. Default pressures to 25 PSI in the front and, six, and 26 PSI in the rear. We have an adjustment range of 15 PSI at the low end and 40 PSI at the top end. That is the same front and rear. We'll bring them back to our default values. 
fuel. We've got it zeroed out to keep the engine quiet. Maximum fuel capacity in here is 86 liters. That's actually not too bad, considering what kind of car this is, but, well, you'll be frequenting the petrol station if you go on a long trip. Electronics. We have the traction control and anti-lock braking system to play with. Traction control is in a few different steps. You can, of course, turn it off. We have steps one through four to play with as well. Assetto Corsa with its reverse psychology. Step one is the maximum assist. ABS, we can turn that on and off. We will run with it on as this is a road car. Alignment, we can adjust camber and tow on all four corners if we want. Default value shown here. Generic, just the brake power can we play with here. No brake bias adjustments available either in the pits or on the fly. What we'll do is we will run it here on the hypercar road tires at the default pressures and we'll put some fuel in the tank. 35 liters should suffice. We won't touch anything else with the electronics. We can play with the traction control on the fly if we so desire. Into the cockpit now, everything has come to life. You can see that we now have oil and water temperature on the left-hand side of the dashboard. Tachometer in the center, now with a gear position indicator going all the way up from neutral into seventh gear, and then all the way down through neutral again and reverse. Hopefully we won't need reverse. Just to the right of the tachometer, you can see that we have our KERS deployment meter. And then over on the right-hand side, the green bar that you can see there, that is the state of charge of our main KERS battery. Below that, the analog gauge, that is a speedometer, goes up to 400 kilometers per hour. Remember, we're geared out to 422, so I guess it's theoretically possible to go off-scale high on the speedometer in La Ferrari. Over there in the bottom left, fuel gauge, we're just below half a tank. Other than that, those are the only things that we'll be looking at in the cockpit as we're going along. Pedals displayed in the lower left as always. Clutch is automatically controlled, so the computer has the clutch. First gear selected, and we'll just reasonably pull away. Not even half throttle, and we're up to the pit lane speed limit well before the limiter line. And this is probably the only time we'll be using 7th gear throughout the whole run. Just getting out onto the track. You do have to build a little bit of brake temperature in this car. We are dealing with carbon ceramic brakes, so yeah, they're a little bit temperature sensitive. We'll just build a little bit of brake temperature. You don't have to go crazy with it. It's not like a Formula 1 car, but... It's kind of similar in a lot of respects, as we shall see when we really open it up. Even here just at low speeds, though, you can hear that V12 gurgling away behind us. Also, across the top of the steering wheel, I neglected to mention this, but it'll be obvious in a moment, shift lights across the top of the steering wheel. That's a feature that we first saw on the Enzo, and it was really cool back then. It's still really cool today. That was pretty much full revs on the motor. We will go up basically to 9,000 RPM. Yeah, 9,000 RPM on a street-legal V12. That's ridiculous. And there is the power. 9,000 RPM on a street legal V12 with a 6.3 liter displacement. That's nothing short of absolute bedlam. I can't read the speedometer. I have no idea how fast we're going. That was probably around 230 clicks if I had to guess. We are on step 104 of the traction control. Maximum assist coming out of the last Rivazza corner down start finish. The acceleration that we get coming down the start finish straight is absolutely mind bending. 950 horsepower from the V12 and the hybrid system. There goes 300 kilometers an hour. Topping out at around 315 down the straight. For comparison's sake, the late model Formula One cars, they'll do anywhere between 320 and 335 down the start finish straight here, so. We're really only about 20 kilometers an hour slower than a Formula One car in a straight line. That is pretty wild when you consider that this thing is street legal. It 
into Tosa, a little bit of understeer again, road tires. But we do have the brakes coming up to temperature. On the brake, some backfire there on the overrun, throwing it into Piratella. Again, little bits of understeer. That's all down to the tires, though. Again, these tires are designed to last for about 15 to 20,000 miles, so yeah, some grip has to be conceded. But there are no concessions made when it comes to the amount of horsepower that this thing has. Again, 950 horsepower in a street-legal car. From the factory, I might add. <laughs> that is ridiculous power. Now that we have got some heat into everything, we can speak representatively. Down the straights, you just notice the insane amount of horsepower that you've got. The acceleration is mind-bending. I think the zero to 100 kilometer an hour acceleration time, it's sub three and a half seconds for sure. It's probably closer to three seconds or so. I don't recall the exact number at the moment. But let's just say it happens fast enough to where it's really not even an issue. A little bit of chatter from the front axle there through the Villeneuve chicane. Again, you are going to get understeer. You are going to get some front end chatter. That's down to us being on road tires at the moment. Chassis itself, though, if you can sort of isolate the chassis dynamics from the tires, it is most decidedly neutral even when you get into heavy braking, there is even the slightest hint of oversteer coming in on the brakes, and depending on how aggressive you are over the apex curbing, you can definitely pick up some oversteer. Traction control is going to be your friend if you are a little bit less enthusiastic of a person. You can see there, you can just nail the throttle and let the computer take care of the rest. No issues there with wheel spin. Of course, if you want to turn off traction control like this, well, you can start to have some fun. As you can see, yep, bouncing off the rev limiter in $3 million because we can. Having to be pretty careful on the brakes even though we have the ABS switched on. That's just the kind of car this is. the shift lights across the top of the steering wheel five red lights that's all you've got a little bit of twitch there right in the beginning of the braking phase there you gotta be careful and you can really get the tail out if you want again when you remember the price tag of this thing and you remember how exclusive it is perhaps you would think twice about being a little bit too exuberant, unless you're one of the few people who have this car to whom I assume money is no object. But still, a car like this, you, you understand, I assume, how important it is, how special it is, and that one day when you're gone, long dead and buried, somebody else will want this car. So I would presume that if you've got one of these, you wanna take care of it because it truly is one of those things that is bigger than any one person. That was very rough over the curbs. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's probably a $10,000 repair bill right there. But something also tells me that maybe you don't care as much. And you see right there over the curbing, we actually locked up the right front wheel, even though we have ABS. So it's not exactly straightforward, even when you are using driver aids. Just a little tap on the throttle is all it takes to get the rear end out if you really want. Again, electric motors coupled with the internal combustion engine. Electric motors producing maximum torque from zero 
Therefore, yeah, wheel spin happens. 310 or so kilometers an hour into Tamburello. A little hard to find the apex sometimes. Again, the front axle with the road tires, it's not exactly tuned in terms of being razor sharp. You also notice there is a fair amount of body roll in this car. Again, it's a road car. Some concessions have to be made to drivability and practicality, but the computer systems help you. The active aerodynamics really helps you through high-speed corners. The amount of downforce that you have is pretty substantial. An open-wheel race car, it is not. But considering that you could legally park it anywhere in the known universe, well, that's pretty exciting stuff. Also, you can see on the dashboard that hybrid power indicator. It's bouncing all over the place, particularly in the traction zones. Despite the traction control being switched off, the car also kind of has a built-in traction control into the control algorithm for the hybrid system. It will not deploy full beans just dependent on throttle position. It will read how much traction the rear wheels have at all times, and it will decide when to deploy the maximum electricity boost. When that gauge is fully in blue, that is maximum power going through the hybrid system into the rear axle. When it's fully in white, that is full regen. You'll notice it does not fully go blue for about a second, second and a half after I apply full throttle. As the computer again making all of those calculations, determining when it's safe to give me all 980 horsepower. Again, traction control is off. That's a twitch under braking. Just have to get used to that. Again, the car, not only is it in quite a severe moment of loading in terms of the chassis, but it's also in a severe moment of aerodynamic change. The pitch of the car is changing. The nose is dipping as we apply the brakes. But in addition to that, that rear spoiler that we talked about in showroom view, that thing is deploying to give me a little bit more decel from the aerodynamic side. So the aerodynamics in that moment are quite unstable. That is part of the reason why we have those big twitches under braking from the high speed straights. A little wide there over the AstroTurf. No problem. But as you can see, you could have a lot of fun in this car. Would I dare call it the ultimate road car available today? Well, yeah, yep, I would. No contest. I know the McLaren P1 is faster in a straight line. I know the Porsche 918 is more efficient when it comes to fuel, and it's a little bit more creative when it comes to how it uses its hybrid system. But guess what? I don't care about hybrid systems or fuel efficiency or anything along those lines. I just want speed, and that's exactly what we've got in this car. We're going to put the Trofeo tires on this right now. Pit crew animations going on. There we go. And we'll pull away. And remember, the traction control is still switched off. Confirm that. Yes, it is. There we go. We should have a bit more grip now. Oh, yeah. We've got some more grip. Can tell that already. Get some heat into these tires. Let's see, are they warmed up yet? Well, now they are. 
up the hill. Crest it, break now. Plunge downhill again, a little bit of gravity assist. Fourth gear, Aqua Minerati for the first element, down into second gear for the second one. Clip the apex on the power. You can see more grip now on the rear axle with the better tires. Not nearly as much wheel spin. Traction control is still off. It's just absolutely fantastic. Yes, you get a lot of oversteer moments if you want them. The car allows you to have fun. It allows you to have that slip in the rear axle if you really want it. But it will also be very docile and very conservative if you just want to be a little bit more of a good citizen. I mean, you know, trash control is still off. But be more measured with your throttle inputs. Be more measured with your steering. You can keep the rear axle completely under control. You can just brake normally. Get your downshifts done. Get on the power again. You won't spin up the rear axle too badly. Again, just change your driving style and the car will do exactly what you're thinking about. We went through Tosa sideways last time. Not this time. See, this to me right here, this is the mark of a good car. I can change the entirety of the car's attitude just based on how I handle it. I don't have to drive around what the car wants to do. I'm not constantly chasing the car. I am 100% in control of it. I am its master. It will obey me under any condition. Right now, I want to drive it more conservatively. Well. It'll do it. Not a single moment of snap over steer anywhere on that lap. Not any uncontrollable understeer. No lock up on the brakes there. It does exactly what you want when you want it. If you want to have a little bit more fun, well, you know, just stab at the throttle a little bit more, get the tail out, and yeah, you can start to have some more fun. You see what I mean? It does exactly what you want in exactly the manner in which you want it to happen. No questions asked, it just does it. This car is just as good as you are. Perhaps that is what makes it the definitive Ferrari. Perhaps that's why it deserves its name. Perhaps that's why it is La Ferrari. It is that definitive statement of we as a company not only are we willing to put our name on it, but we are willing to give it our name. That's how much confidence we have in this car. That is how much it means to us. That is how much of an indicator it is to what we can do with it. That's how confident we are in the technology and the engineering. It is the Ferrari. In that vein, I have no qualms about it whatsoever. When I think of Ferrari, I think of cars that will do whatever their drivers want them to do. They have so much performance in reserve that you can be Sebastian Vettel or you can be Kimi Raikkonen and you could get into one of their cars and it will give you a good time. In the same vein, you could be somebody who perhaps made his millions as a property developer and doesn't really know left from right when it comes to driving, but you could still appreciate it for what it is, and it will show you a good time. That is the mark of a great car. That is something that I think of when I hear the name Ferrari. That is something that I have always envisioned of what driving a Ferrari would be like. It would be something that will give you exactly what you want, whenever you want it, in the name 
of exclusivity and in the name of opulence, sure, but at the same time, Ferraris are built for drivers, and drivers will appreciate this car just as much as somebody who's getting one simply because they want one. I have to say, it is the greatest driving experience that you can have with two doors and a roof. Unquestionably. Is the FXXK faster? Well, of course it is. But remember, that car is basically a race car. This is something that you could take home at night and park in your garage and say good night to. I'll see you in the morning which I'm sure everybody who has one of these cars does, <laughs> because they're worth that much. But yes, that is exactly what this car is and what it is not. It is not a no-holds-barred race car. It is a road car for the road, but it is so very, very good at doing what it does that you don't care that, okay, there's another Ferrari, the FXXK, that is faster. No, this is an entity in and of itself, and again, it fully does deserve the name La Ferrari. It is the Ferrari. Now, of course, I know all of you are also probably wondering, well, you drive all these Formula One cars so often, how could you be so taken aback by a road car with two seats and a roof and airbags and all kinds of crumple zones and whatnot? Well, it's just the kind of car it is. Again, you have to adjust your mindset to take in what is in front of you in an objective sense. You can't just say, well, I've driven cars that are faster even though they're built for entirely different purposes and, well, this is slower because, well, it's not the same kind of car. For what this car is, for what it's designed to be, it is absolutely the best that it could be. Again, fully deserving of being the Ferrari. However, there are quite a few similarities between this car and its Formula One cousins. So, why not put this car up against the 2013 Ferrari F138 and just show you how similar they actually are? Stand by. Welcome back to Imola. And, well, this is the prospect we have. We are in the Ferrari F138, La Ferrari alongside us on the grid in pole position. We have five laps. Let's just see if we can catch up to it after we pass it for the first time. We'll try to run in formation at the end. We'll take the start. Now, of course, the Formula One car is always going to be faster than the road car, but have a look at the kinds of things that we have in here. We've got a multifunction, fancy steering wheel that's worth many thousands of dollars. We've got shift lights. We've got a dashboard that's showing us a whole bunch of critical information, but only critical information. We have a KERS system, as you can see. I'm on the button now. It's basically a very similar sort of curves that is in La Ferrari. Of course, it's in driver control for us right now. La Ferrari, it's automatic, but same idea, same overall philosophy. Give the engine some help in driving the car. A little bit more propulsive force. Again, this car is a 2013 car. This is the last V8 Formula One Ferrari. But from the same year that LaFerrari was introduced into production. As close as we are going to get to a racing analog to that absolutely fantastic road car. I 
want you to take a look at the straight line speed. I have DRS open now, 300 kilometers an hour, 310. 312 before we got to jump on the brakes. Guess what? La Ferrari is going faster in a straight line than we are in this trim. Believe it or not, La Ferrari also has more power than we do. Right here we're sitting at about 800 horsepower. La Ferrari 950. V8, these V8 Formula One cars, just I, I love running through the gears in them. I'm not a huge fan of the aerodynamics from 2009 to 2013, but I do like the exhaust blowing at the rear end. You do have a lot of rear downforce, more than you might initially expect from these cars given the size of the rear wings, but I love how smooth the engines are. Topping out here in seventh gear, 313 kilometers an hour. La Ferrari faster down the straight. When you consider that this car weighs a whole lot less than La Ferrari, it weighs about 50% less than La Ferrari does. The acceleration is comparable. That is absolutely staggering. Not sure, are we gonna catch him? Are we gonna catch him to lap him? I don't know. 43 seconds is the gap. Have about an 80 second lap around here. I don't know, we're gonna try. <laughs> I did not test this out beforehand. <laughs> Whatever happens, that's actually a fairly good indication of how fast La Ferrari really is. No, you cannot legitimately compare any road car to any race car because they are just fundamentally different animals built for fundamentally different purposes. But the fact that you can even mention them in the same breath without sounding like a complete idiot is definitely worth something. What's the gap here on lap four? He hasn't crossed the line yet. We're working on catching up to him. And I don't know if we will by the end of lap five, which is the next lap. not catching him down the straights, I'll tell you that much. 66 seconds. We're pulling out about 20 seconds a lap. We might just do it. There he is, I can see him going through Villeneuve. Can we get him? He's approaching Piratella. There he is, we've got him. Look at this, I'm revving it out in fourth gear. 
and I'm not catching him down the straights. Let's see, he'll get on the power right now. Can we catch him? Look at this, full throttle in a Formula One car, and we're keeping up with him. We're not overtaking him, we're just keeping up. That's spectacular. Look at this, nailing it to the line. DRS engaged, Kurs. Look at that, right up into sixth gear. Right up into sixth gear, we're right neck and neck with him. That is unbelievable. <laughs> Quite honestly, I, I never did that test before. I've never run a Formula One car next to LaFerrari, and uh, at least not, not a, a similar one, not one of the era, not one where I wasn't just all out trying to humiliate him. I'm not exaggerating, you can see the pedal trace. Flat out, through third, fourth, fifth, and sixth gear, we're catching him. We're not, we're not catching him. He, he's, he's pulling away from us down the straight as I am in fourth, fifth, and sixth gear, flat out in a Formula One car. And that thing can be registered on the road in pretty much every country. That's... <laughs> I, I can't even begin <laughs> to express how impressive that is. Yes, I know, we were a lap ahead of him, but... I'm at a loss for words. We'll come back when the timing screen comes up. And here are the final results. The Formula One car wins, of course, but you'd be amazed at how close it, it actually is down the straights. It's, it's unbelievable. Obviously, my best lap time, a full 23 seconds faster, but that is astonishing to see just how close these two cars are down the straight. It's, again, that's a road car, and this is a super exclusive, basically one of one race car, and I mean, that's ridiculous. That's absolutely ridiculous. Well, now that we have our head on straight again, some concluding thoughts. Yes, of course, the Formula One car, it's always going to be faster, but just just look at how close they are down the straight the acceleration in this car right here is truly comparable to a formula one car and in fact it might even be slightly better than the formula one car because remember this car has traction control it has active aerodynamics the rear tires on this car are actually a little bit wider than on the back of the f138 such were the regulations in that year so the fact that you can do that one-to-one -one comparison and LaFerrari actually wins when you do the straight line acceleration test, it's, <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, right up through fourth, fifth, and sixth gear, the Formula One car is behind, and it's, it's legitimately behind, flat out, revving it all the way up to the 18,000 RPM red line. It's legitimately slower down a straight. Then La Ferrari, it's amazing. And the fact that Ferrari were able to put this car together when they did, they were in trouble in Formula 1. They hadn't really been consistently winning races for a while. They were nowhere near challenging for the world championship at the time. And the fact that they put a car like this together, as good as it is, as highly polished as it is, and to have the performance that it does, it's really something for the ages. The Enzo, when that came out in 2002, that was spectacular, but by the standard set by this car, the Enzo is slow, and that is saying something. The Enzo could not at all keep up with a V10 Formula One car. This, well, it, it keeps up with a Formula One car of its day. That is something really special. And how many cars out there right now could say legitimately that they can actually beat a Formula One car in a straight line? Not too many, especially not too many that don't have any modifications whatsoever, this one can definitely lay claim to that title. What can I say? La Ferrari, it's been in Assetto Corsa for years, basically since the game's launch, but that's the first time I'm really taking a proper look at it, and again, I just have to recognize once again how absolutely fantastic it is. I drove this car in the first ever Assetto Corsa video that I made back in 2014, and I really haven't done any extended running in it since, and four years is a long time to let something go 
untried, especially since all of the updates that Aceto Corsa has had in the physics and in the graphics department and in the tire model and everything. Just, again, it, it's like meeting this car again for the first time, and I've got to say, it has not failed to impress me one bit. Anyway, I do sincerely hope that you've enjoyed this one. This one turned out to be a lot more fun than I had expected. To conclude us, we do, of course, have hot laps with La Ferrari at Imola from external as well as onboard replays. So do stay tuned for the hot laps, everyone. Thank you all very much for watching. Ferrari Man 601 saying thanks, and of course, we will see you soon.